check check just making sure that the audio is coming through in the stream
<laughs> okay, good evening everyone. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, last lecture from our lecture series, Digital Delights and Disturbances. This is the lecture series organized by the Communications and Media Studies Department. Um, that's the fall 22 season, obviously. And uh, this is the final talk for this season, so uh, stay in touch because we're going to have uh, new speakers in spring 23. Uh, but for the time being, yes, this is a, a goodbye. Um, perfect way to say goodbye is to have a, a guest, <laughs> such as uh, Kylie, Kylie Jarrett. Welcome, <coughs> Kylie Jarrett, uh, to Rome and to John Cabot University. We invited Kylie back into 2020. 2020. Yes, uh, which was unfortunate. <laughs> because, yeah, so she was supposed to be here in spring 2020, and then the pandemic uh, happened, so we had to postpone it. But we are happy to be uh, back in presence uh, because, you know, for a year and a half we have been running online events, uh, dreadful Zoom meetings, uh, and then hybrid. And finally we are back in person so we can enjoy the presence uh, of the students, of yourself, and then also chat together being in presence. Um, so Kylie Jarrett, uh, and I thank you so much for giving such a title, because as, as you can see from the screen, from commodification to ascetization, reconciling the delights and disturbances of digital labor. And I'm thankful because uh, she played with the words like the title of our lecture series, Digital Delights and Disturbances. That's a perfect uh, ending for our lecture series. So Kylie is a wonderful scholar. Um, uh, associate Professor of Media Studies at Maynooth University in uh, Ireland. Um, and uh, she's the author of many, many publications, but I will just uh, point out her uh, latest book uh, called Digital Labor, uh, just out for Polity Press, which uh, you're going to see in our classes, <laughs> I'm sure, next semester, in at least in digital media culture classes. Um, so the book is just out, uh, and uh, it's uh, a very entertaining book. Uh, even you, you see this title, Digital Labor, and you think, oh, no, my God, labor. But actually, from the get-go, the first page, she starts telling a story, you know? She's a great storyteller, and the story is the story. I don't know if, if she's going to touch upon that, but otherwise I will ask you. Uh, the story of a, a guy uh, who was a food uh, delivery guy during the pandemic. And uh, as you remember, during the pandemic, the food delivery people, they were pretty much the only people who were allowed to circulate in uh, cities. So this is the start, uh, uh, starting image of the book, I won't say more. We'll uh, get some time to discuss uh, uh, Kylie's lecture and her book later. Uh, I'll give the floor to Kylie, and uh, remember that after the talk, uh, we're going to have a Q&A session. We're going to uh, finish by max uh, 8 o'clock. Okay. Thank you, Kylie, for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Donatella. Um, and thank you for the invitation to come to Rome. It's my first time in Rome, if you can believe it. And it's just so ridiculously beautiful. I just, I can't believe the place is real. I'm delighted. and delighted to finally get here. Just speaking closer to the microphone. Is that good enough up there? Yes, good. Good, lovely. All right. So again, thank you for allowing me to come uh, to Rome. Um, so as Donatella suggested, what I'm talking about today comes out of my new book, uh, Digital Labour, um, uh, which has the great cover. They did a very clever cover um, uh, for this book. And also um, some of what I'm talking about is expanded in this um, journal article, uh, um, Sociologia del Lavoro. Um, sorry, my Italian is short, um, but it's an Italian journal. It just happens to be in English. So that's the article um, that kind of expands this idea about assetization that I'm talking about today. So, um, as Don Teller suggested, the digital labour book covers a range of kinds of work, platform work. Um, but what I want to focus on today is creative work, um, creative platform work. Um, so, kind of looking at like TikTokers and YouTubers and OnlyFans creators and quite show live streamers bloggers, as well as, you know, the now iconic influencers. So that kind of form of digital labor is going to be the focus of my talk today. <clears throat> so this kind of work, this creative work, 
has been critiqued from a political economy perspective as dis disturbing. Uh, it's one of the disturbances of, of digital media. For the exhaustive extractive mechanisms associated with the platform economy, the, the, the labor exploitation, the precarious work, etc. And you know, much has been said of uh, all of platform mediated work that it is precarious, it is, it is um, disturbing in various forms. But creative digital labor has been specifically critiqued because of the way it enrolls subjectivity into economic calculation. Um, it, it involves a, a kind of selling yourself and your identity. And this has been described as a process of commodification, and, and, and that's considered to be a really bad thing. So to sell your identity, your embodiment, your subjectivity online is often cast as inherently destructive and inherently disturbing. But is this really what's going on? Um, <clears throat> so many of the studies into influences, for instance, document the delights and pleasures of this kind of work, um, uh, uh, and, and the delights for, of, uh, of the work for the people in this creative economy who use the platforms for self-expression and for social and economic agency. So how do we reconcile the disturbing commodification with these delights and pleasures um, of platform uh, creative work? So what I want to do today is to kind of challenge this kind of easy and quite common um, critique of this work as a process of commodification and, 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 and of work that enrolls subjectivity as a process of commodification and pose instead a different way of thinking about this work economically. Um, so I'm going to be drawing on the work of Belgian philosopher Michel Fair, um, it, his um, theories into the role of assets in the financialized economy. Um, and I want to use the idea of asset as a model for thinking differently about work that uses your subjectivity or relies on your subjectivity. Um, <clears throat> have to excuse me, I'm, I'm recovering from COVID and I still have a little bit of a cough, which is very annoying. So, so what I'm going to do first is talk a bit about how subjectivity is enrolled in online creative work and then talk about how it's described as commodification and then to challenge that by proposing assetization as a different model and then talk a bit about the agency that um, uh, is enabled by this particular framework. So. So the marketing of subjectivity is at the core of creator culture, um, not least uh, as the intimacy of digital platforms places a premium on displays of personality. Your phone is intimate, the image is intimate, um, it, it involves, uh, kind of uh, enrolls subjectivity at, at its core. So consequently, studies of influencers and social media creators <clears throat> are typically fo focused on the intersection of commodity logics with the selfhood or identity of these workers. But but also on the particular ways subjectivity is managed in relation to that work. So this is exemplified in the work of influencers who are asked to embody a particular lifestyle or consumer orientation that both appeals to followers as an aspirational, yet relatable and desirable um, form of lifestyle, but also is one that appeals to the aesthetic demands of the uh, brand partners who want to align with them. Um, we can also see this, though, not just in influencers, but in the work of podcasters or vloggers or cameras or any other creative worker who is seeking to generate revenue through brand partners or from followers via subscriptions or tip jars. Um, so the key work, the key labor of many creators is to attract audiences to their self-presentation and then to leverage that micro-celebrity. They're about creating micro-celebrity. Um, what this requires then is self-branding. So making their personality the source of their capital, the source of their income source. Uh, so uh, this is what allows them to become viewed as viable but as brand partners, having a meaningful micro-celebrity. So this context places a premium on cultivating a pleasing subjectivity and aesthetic expression of self. And there's many studies that document the extraordinary complex labor involved in this economy. And I'm also assuming um, Carolina talked a bit about this as well, if you were at her talk. Um, <clears throat> 
So many of the studies about um, and creative culture have uh, explored the representations of masculinity or femininity that are the core content of sites like Instagram, for instance, or OnlyFans, as well as in the beauty and fashion blogging, um, which happens across platforms. So here you've got this core part of yourself, this embodied gender or sexuality, which is being refashioned um, to become content for the gram. Um, it also then becomes constantly managed in relation to that, um, that aesthetic, that demand, that um, need. Um, also at the same time, drawing an affective relations and expression to sustain the audience. So creators have been described as being engaged in particular performances of calibrated amateurism, which is an idea from Crystal Aberdeen, and also these particular performances of relatability, which is something Akani Kanai talks about. These performances um, can involve not only the, though, involve not only the carefully, um, uh, uh, the presentation of carefully curated versions of self and scenario, but also the enrollment of family and friends in the production, the photo dump of the making of um, the a recent post which shows all of the production people, which is usually family and friends. Um, and all of that creates this aura of authenticity that's demanded uh, this, this, of this self um, that's being presented and being sold. So we're talking about the enrollment of interpersonal affective relations into the workplace in order to sustain this brand. Similarly, uh, relational labour, which is an idea Nancy Bame articulates, has also become recognised aspect of the work of online platform creators. So studies describe the calculated levels of responsiveness and engagement with followers, whether that's in the form of comments or retweets or likes, um, or whether it's that immaterial level of attention to the kind of trends that are engaging the audience at the time, um, and the tastes and beliefs of their followers that um, influencers and creators have to follow. <clears throat> so the of managing the affective relationship between themselves and their followers is at the core of online creative work uh, as, and, and part of what they're doing is seeking to create and sustain parasocial relationships uh, with their audience members, with their followers. Um, creators are also at the mercy of algorithms that determine their visibility on the platform, and their visibility on the platform then determines their follower numbers. Um, so this means that they often align their content, which again is primarily a presentation of self, to the particular algorithmic logics of the platform or platforms that mediate their labour. So they um, are assessed by computational, also assessed by computational influence and management tools that assess their presentation of self in terms of dubiously constructed principles of brand safety and cooperation. So the self has to be something that brand uh, uh, management tools also uh, assess as being valuable. So uh, as Sophie Bishop says, to be a successful vlogger or, or cr online creator um, on YouTube, one must make oneself legible to the site's algorithm. So one must present a self that is readable and understandable and approved of by algorithms and automated tools. So from this brief sketch of creative labor, and I can tell you that's just the briefest of sketches that I've been doing, um, it should be clear that creation, management, and calibration of identity, selfhood, subjectivity, affect, embodiment, gender, race, sexuality, are at the core of work in the online creator economy. But subjectivity is also enrolled um, via Another mechanism, by um, the entrepreneurialism that underpins the hustle of the online creator economy. This is the environment that demands you do what you love. Um, and it involves, it demands psychic investment in your work and also produces these affective rewards. That's the kind of nature of entrepreneurialism. So passion is the entrepreneurial, imp entrepreneurial impetus and it runs deeply into the subjectivity of workers. As Silvia La Russa says, uh, describes, to be entrepreneurial requires more than donning a costume. Uh, it's a sensibility, and it invades the realm of character, making good humor, optimism, and cordiality a competitive advantage to cultivate. So to be entrepreneurial is an identity as much as a practice. It's a holistic commitment that spans work and non-work context and penetrates deeply into the self. So to be an a entrepreneurial creator uh, in, on the platform economy is requiring a hell of a lot of your subjective dimensions of being. So the um, selfhood is both the raw material and the product 
of creative work in the platform economy. So creative culture is thus an arena where subjectivity itself, or as Biffa Barardi would have it, the soul of the worker is put to work. Um, <clears throat> so subjectivity, important to create a culture. How has this then been critiqued? So, so a lot of the descriptions um, of this enrollment of subjectivity into this work environment describes it as a process of commodification. And it's, been, it's quite common uh, for that to be a term that gets used within these studies. Um, certainly in the popular press, um, uh, influencers and creators are often described as being vain, frivolous dupes, um, but at the same time also venal, toxic, calculating self-exploiters. It's an interesting tension to balance there. Um, so this contradictory vilification and celebration of people like the Kardashians uh, is emblematic of kind of much popular discourse about this kind of work. Um, there are moral panics about the exploitation of children, as well as the selling of sexual content. Um, or both of which are always too often assumed to be an act of victimhood. Um, now, academic studies, on the other hand, offer a lot more nuance than these kind of popular interpretations, but they nevertheless are disquieted by this work um, quite regularly, and quite often describe it, and, and quite often this disquiet comes from it being described as uh, commodification. So some um, theorists suggest there is a process of self-commodification, that people are constructing themselves and selling themselves, um, while others suggest that commodification has been imposed on creators um, as corporations have taken an interest in their practice. So these otherwise organic lived experiences have been commercialized and, and corporatized uh, by evil uh, corporations. So just to give you some examples uh, that demonstrate the breadth of what has been considered to be commodified in creator cultures, um, Zhu here, uh, for example, describes um, the instrumentalization of affects, bodies, and human interactions, and the erosion of users' freedom and individuality in live streaming work. Um, uh, she's looking at... Uh, Kaisho, I think, live streamers. Um, studies also document the commodification of black culture and urban aesthetics, um, involved fatherhood. Um, desire itself has also been considered to be commodified in uh, creator culture. Children and pets are described as commodified in the work of influencers. Um, and studies also document the commercialization of political movements and ideological commitments, such as feminism or the body positive movement. Now, Brooke Duff who does great work on beauty bloggers, um, documents the wariness and weariness of some of these bloggers when confronted with the constant demand to commodify their personal relationships and the intimate parts of their lives in their feeds. So this problem of commodification is out there in the literature as a key issue. <clears throat> so while the various studies I'm talking about here, actually, uh, I've done them a disservice, I think. They do offer really rich insights into the experiential qualities and the delights of this kind of work. And they describe these as important sites of agency. They nevertheless fall into this idea that this is a process of commodification and often don't really fully develop what that means. It's generally just assumed that this is a bad thing, that this is the critique. I say it's commodified and it's a critique. Um, um, so the tacit underpinning, I think, the tacit assumption underpinning this as, as a critique, the idea of just claiming its commodification and that serving as a critique, um, reflects what Viviana Zelizer uh, describes as the a hostile world's thesis. This is the idea that commercialization and intimacy and intimate and uh, subjective aspects of life cannot coexist without a fundamental, fundamentally detrimental impact to the individual and through that society. So this is is a, a common cultural understanding. Um, and we see this in how um, society constantly negotiates and renegotiates what is an acceptable commodification of intimacy. That happens in law. It also happens uh, particularly around issues to do with sex work. So the wide resonance of this idea, though, that intimacy, commodification, commercial imperatives, economics, and selfhood, subjectivity, and intimacy live in completely separate worlds, um, allows declarations of commodification to serve as an easy blanket critique that's often used to problematize the nature of this labor or this industry. <coughs> and I think that's what's been going on uh, in these studies. 
But what is really happening when we talk about commodification? And is, does that really capture what's happening in this work? So if we unpack the concept a little, we can see that it actually, I think, doesn't fit and doesn't describe what's going on in the creative economy. So I'm going to get a bit Marxist on you for a sec, so bear with me. So I do that. I have a habit of getting a bit Marxist on people. So um, <clears throat> in Marxian thinking, so what is commodification, right? In Marxian thinking, commodification is the process by which objects with a use value or things with a use value, which is an, uh, an ability to satisfy a human need, become dominated by exchange value or the, what they can achieve in the marketplace. So something that has a utility to people suddenly being dominated by price. Um, so this, objectifica oh, this objectification disembeds the object uh, uh, from its original context. So this pro process of commodification uh, disembeds the object from its original context, which gave it its meaning uh, and its use, and overlays on it this abstract objective meaning in the form of monetary value. So in doing so, it strips the object of its, its richer culturally embedded uh, significance in effect destroying the value, the real value of that object. So as Lukas says, through commodification, meaningful artifacts and practices develop a new objectivity, a new substantiality. And here's the important bit, which destroys their original and authentic um, substantiality. So in transformation into a commodity, an object or subject also becomes reified. It becomes thing-like and thus passive and static. It becomes an object that's divested from its context and is able to float about uh, um, uh, and be transferred to others and to stand apart from its maker. Um, and, it, uh, and in doing that, the creator of that object loses control of it. It goes and can transfer it to someone else. And this is the process of alienation. So when this process of commodification is applied to context of work, the transformation into a commodity object uh, is the tragedy of a worker as they become alienated from the products of their labor. Um, so the products they make get turned into objects that are disembedded from their use value and uh, go out into the world and are separated from them. But it also is uh, their labor itself becomes commodified in the form of labor time. So th that alienates the worker from conscious working activity themselves. It becomes something dominated by monetary value and not dominated by the significance for the worker. So um, ultimately, this process of commodification alienates the worker from their species being. Uh, that's the Marxist perspective on this. So this is one of the founding premises of Marxism uh, and much critique of labor and the commercialization of culture and cultural work um, uh, is predicated on this idea of alienation from species being. But this critique seems heightened when what we're considering here and what is being produced and what is being commodified is subjectivity, identity, affect, these most intimate and generally considered inalienable aspects of our human existence being turned into objects that have a market value. It seems to heighten this critique. And we're fundamentally, as the, the Hostile Worlds thesis tells us, fundamentally discomforted by the idea of commercializing these inalienable aspects of ourself, um, which again is why we have a problem with sex work. <clears throat> but this argument about against commodification, right? So that's the basic argument of commodification. You commodify something, you turn it into an object, and it becomes alienated from the person who created it. And therefore, they're no longer able to realize themselves through that activity. So this argument about, against commodification can be traced ultimately to Marx's typification of workers. So he described workers under capitalism as free in order to, um, to be in a position to sell your labor power to a capitalist, you can't be in a condition where you're obliged to do so. If you're obliged to give that work labor to that employer, then uh, you're involved in servitude or slavery, and that's not a capitalist market relation. So workers are always free in capitalism. So, but to be free, though, as uh, this quote from Michel Fair documents, um, he summarizes Marx's description here, and he says, to be free requires there are aspects of self that exist outside of capitalist systems in the framework Marx presupposes. So the, for the free subject, uh, uh, um, uh, presupposes that we are sovereign subjects, that we are free to dispose of what we own. Um, 
And this, in turn, presupposes that we do not grow spiritually rich in the same way we acquire material wealth. We need this space outside of the market, outside of uh, exchange value, where we can actually create meaningful things, engage our species being. This is what's essential. So the alienation that comes from the commodification of their labor power is the tragedy of this free laborer. They no longer have this space outside of the market um, where their activity can produce themselves uh, uh, in kind of meaningful ways, where they can um, have this kind of spiritually rich uh, life. So commodification results in the denial of their freedom, their inalienable dignity, and their emotional and mental growth. So based on this thesis, when inalienable aspects of self, our labor power, our identity, our culture, our sexuality, are pulled into economic calculations and revenue generation, the individual is assumed to substantially lose their capacity for autonomy and agency. <clears throat> So, as a form of commodification, the entanglement with economic imperatives that we see in creator culture um, rely on this critique, a drawing on this critique, um, even though I don't necessarily know they think they know they are doing that. So, because the, the, the implicit, uh, often unspoken um, idea is that this process of commodification strips the subjectivity of these creators of its real value. This become a fixed, decontextualized object defined primarily in the abstract terms of economic markets. So the products of creators' labor, which is their identity, is considered to be alienated from them, standing outside and apart from them as it now circulates in a marketplace of other similarly abstracted things. So when read through this orthodox Marxist lens, the practice of turning lived uh, experience and socially embodied and uh, embedded and socially embodied selves into memes or online micro-celebrities uh, for consumption by markets is a great tragedy. It makes sense that this is a critique. But I'm going to suggest that the term commodification is used very, very loosely in these studies. It's often used merely to gesture to, where, uh, to practices where embodied aspects of identity become entangled with commercial imperatives, but without really fully teasing out the full implications of what I've just described as the actual process of commodification. Just being anywhere near commercial uh, imperatives seems to warrant this label of commodification. But if we follow... Um, uh, the economic logic of commodification to its full, its application seems both inappropriate and unproductive. It's difficult, for instance, that to pass this kind of, the, this framing of commodification with the complex pleasures and meanings that the stu these studies also document in the lived practices of these creators. They don't fit together. You can't be commodified and alienated and still have this kind of rich lived experience that's also being documented. Um, so it becomes difficult to understand how the individuals described in these studies can function when their whole identity has become detached from them and sold to someone else, when they become so fundamentally alienated from self. So to my mind, the language of commodification does not seem to accurately depict what happens when subjectivity is enrolled in economics. And a long time ago, um, cultural studies taught us that it was way too reductive to argue that commercialization of the aspects of self that are grounded in meaningful social, affective, and psychic activity can only result in the total alienation of those dispositions and the end of their use value. So while a post by an influencer uh, on Instagram may well be um, abstracted and expropriated for use in the calculative economics of that platform or by a brand partner or a talent agency, it's never only that. An influencer or camera may construct an embodied self informed by capitalist rationality, but this does not necessarily mean that identity is not an inalienable part of themselves, of their subjectivity. It remains their lived self and is involved in meaningful interpersonal interactions, even while it's in the service of capital. So the logics of commodification, which suppose that complete domination of exchange value and absolute alienation, doesn't really capture the, the persistence of the ineffable, the inalienable, in evidence in this form of labor. So to my mind, the metaphor of the commodity, of the object that is sold in the marketplace, seems increasingly inappropriate to describe the incorporation of embodied subjectivity uh, into economics that we see in the creative economy. So how else then can we frame it, I hear you asking. Excuse me. <clears throat> to be 
begin to do that, we need to return to the concept of the central subject of capitalism. So Michel Fair argues that the central figure in the contemporary economy is no longer Marx's free laborer. Rather, it is the human capitalist. This is the worker who invests in and leverages their capacity within the uh, economy. The human capitalist, he says, has become the dominant subjective form um, into, amongst today's workers who seek to develop and appreciate the value of themselves as a form of currency in the marketplace. <clears throat> so contrary to the free laborer, this kind of subject does not demand the distinction between the inside of the marketplace and the outside, between the spheres of production and reproduction, work and leisure. Rather, this subject conceives of those spheres holistically, simultaneously, considering, activating, and developing dimensions of their subjectivity in both arenas at the same time, as part of the drive for a good, meaningful life. And they do this by developing their human capital. So the idea of human capital was initially a means um, uh, for understanding and calculating the increase in earnings associated with educational attainment or skills training, which is documented in a foundational study by ba Becker from 1993, I think, or maybe even earlier. Anyway. However, the idea of human capital increasingly became reframed as the form of value added to corporations by the skills, personalities, traits, attributes, and competencies of employees. So as knowledge intensive and service industries expanded over the latter half of the 20th century, the accumulation and deployment of human capital began increasingly to be viewed as central to a company's competitive advantage. So the value of a firm today is typically calculated by assessing its tangible assets, uh, tangible properties such as its material infrastructure, its factories and its machinery, um, and its financial assets, you know, its shares, its stocks. But that in concert with the intangibilities of intellectual capital, which is in part comprised of human capital, which is the value added by the skills of, of their workforce. So corporations have at least ideally become focused on enhancing the capacities embodied in their workforce through staff development, hiring, retention practices. So human capital is a key commercial asset today. Increasingly, though, human capital is uh, going back to this idea as something that workers are encouraged to develop, to build. So in lifelong learning schemes, compulsory training programs for the unemployed, the wide-ranging field of business self-help literature, which is a huge field. I've never been in a bookshop and seen how much self-help literature there is about business. In all of these ways, workers are exhorted to develop their skills, their personality, and their leadership qualities to secure hiring and or promotion, or to become more entrepreneurial and uh, achieve your passion as an entrepreneur. So developing your own potential is also a feature of neoliberal governance systems in which people are encouraged to become entrepreneurs of themselves, to work constantly on their subjectivity, to maximize the value of their human capital in society. So accruing human capital is about actively accumulating the life experiences, affects, aptitudes, relationships, or comportments that can be positively valued by a range of potential investors, especially employers. But it's not only employers. Enterprising subjects today invest in themselves so that others will do likewise. For online creators, developing their human capital and seeking investment in their capital is central to what they do. What creators uh, are doing when they invest energy in identifying, developing, enhancing, and performing appropriate personality traits, aesthetic sensibilities, or embodied expressions of sexuality is growing their subjective human capital. And in this way, I suggest that the, creative, the, the workers in the online creative platform economy are ideal human capitalists. <laughs> Moreover, they're also overtly seeking investors in that capital. So these investors range from followers to brand partners to the algorithms that determine their visibility on the platform's feeds. Um, the key investor, though, is always users or followers, because you know, on some platforms, securing a large number of followers is essential to even qualify for monetization programs. Um, this means that online creators are primarily reliant on the investment by fans in the products they offer, the product which is themselves and their subjectivity. 
So dependence on audience traffic or engagement means they are constantly subjected, using a quote from Fair again, constantly subjected to the selecting power and continuous ratings of these followers. You never have a follower for life. You have to constantly be pleasing your followers to ensure they remain. Um, and we can see these ratings overtly in follower numbers, tips, subscription rates to OnlyFans, for instance, advertising revenue offered by a platform, or in the rates charged by, uh, by brand partners for promotion of products. And these fluctuate over time, rising and falling with follower numbers and the ebbs and flows of algorithmically generated reach and impact. Um, uh, but they exist really integrally in those all-important follower numbers um, as a kind of constant rating. So it's this need for continued reinvestment by followers in the performance of the influencer, of the creator, that drives that perpetual maintenance and expression of identity, the constant renewal and uh, redeployment and following the trends that is at the core of the work, um, at the core uh, of the creator economy. So, <clears throat> viewed as a product, uh, oh, I've just done that. Viewed as a product in which others invest, the embodied subjectivity of the creator uh, um, is not produced as a commodity, but as a core asset, as a form of capital that is leveraged to secure economic advantage. So in uh, working on their sexual performance, in developing what Jamie Hakem calls their erotic capital, an OnlyFans creator is making a more valuable or more creditworthy asset in the attention marketplace of social media. They're building, uh, um, they engage in this self-crafting with the view to securing investors in that identity, who might be followers or subscribers, but also brand partners and platform algorithms. So the sunk costs of time, money, or resources um, that go into shaping their own skills and subjectivity um, undertaken by these workers are a bet on the future gains that they may receive from the investment of others in that investment in their human capital. So they invest in it with the expectation that others will invest in it. And you have to hope that pays off, that all that labor gone into yourself pays off. <clears throat> So in this way, I suggest the, the embodied subjectivity of creators in the platform economy is not being commodified, but being turned into an asset. It is not being sold, it is being leveraged. It is being assetized. Uh, so to understand this distinction further, it's vital to understand how very different the asset is to the commodity, especially in the context of labor. As Kaczynski summarizes, the commodity is exclusive. Whoever has sold a commodity does not own it anymore. Regaining commodities that have been sold would, uh, would, uh, would only be possible for those who, who, if they bought them back. Subjectivity, though, is a non-rivalrous good, which means its consumption by one person does not necessarily preclude its consumption by another, including the worker themselves. So the subjectivity that's incorporated into the economic calculations of capital is not used up by that exchange, nor is it ever fully possessed by the employer. It's still available to the worker. Um, so, um, so the asset lacks these exclusive qualities and so matches um, the type of uh, uh, um, uh, product that we're seeing um, in the uh, online creator economy. It is not bought and consumed like cake, but invested in and speculated on. Because the subjectivity of the worker is not used up by the exchange, nor does it become the exclusive possession of the platform, the follower, or the brand partner who consumes it. It's merely being assessed and valued in the terms that these uh, stakeholders set. Also, unlike the commodity, which is heavy and tied to materiality, an asset is alive and unfixed. It retains its subjective qualities always. It does not um, passively represent a pre-given objective value, but actively formats the socioeconomic terrain and its practices. It refuses, it has an unfixed performative speculative logic um, that is always future oriented. It's not a simple thing. It's not a thing. Um, it refuses to be actually be fully thing-like. So it effectively, it can't then effectively be transferred to someone else. It's always grounded and embedded in the subjectivity of its creator, of its, uh, of its maker, even when it's being traded on the market. 
So human capital never reaches the kind of fungibility or fetish qualities that make it a commodity, or at least merely a commodity. So the idea of the asset more usefully describes the nature of labor power within commercial exchanges, especially when that labor is centered in immaterial and inalienable aspects of self. So assetization also corresponds with how human capital functions as a commercial asset. An assetized house is not one that is being used for commercial gain through, uh, through is one that is being used for commercial gain through renting or being used as collateral, but it's not sold and given away. It remains in the possession of the homeowner, when, even while subject to market valuation and fluctuation. This is the same thing that we see with the, uh, a worker who is marketing their embodied subjectivity or selling their labor power to an employer or a platform by opening those assets to an ongoing valuation. <clears throat> this value can't be uh, ent uh, entirely produced or captured by the enterprise that exploits it. The worker's subjectivity is merely tapped into and channeled. So to my way of thinking, an asset, an assetization more accurately describes the product and the process associated with the exploitation and the commodification, or commodification, I used it myself, <laughs> and the marketing of subjectivity in the online creative economy. But there's, there's another reason to, to, to use this different framework, and that's, I think, there is a, the continued possession of the, the asset by the creator makes assetization a more agential framing for thinking about creator labor. Seen through this lens, the subjectivity is not objectified and sold. Um, it's, a, its possession is never transferred. It's thus not alienated from the worker in the manner suggested by the economic framework of commodification. It may be invested in by the creator through self-fashioning, attention to markets, social and cultural trends, and aestheticization that reflect commercial principles. It may also be given an economic valuation in the digital marketplace, but it's not technically commodified and sold. And so the creator remain, it retains important levels of control and agency in what happens to that uh, um, product uh, once it's created, once it's been in the process of consumption. This framing suggests that alienation is not the key ill associated with the commercialization of subjectivity and online contexts. And there's a lot more work, I think, that needs to be done uh, 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 finding a different way to critique these dynamics than alienation. And I know I was talking to Michel Fair, and he's, he's writing a new book, and he's developing this critique. And we're talking about whether it's devaluation or downgrading is the, what happens to assets. And maybe that's the harm, that one of the harms that's uh, implicit in this kind of work. More work needs doing here. This is just a bookmark. Um, but I think we also need to look differently at the potential for resistance if you, uh, that happens. Um, Lucas argues that, that being able to challenge um, exploitation is not normally possible for workers whose labor power extends into their subjectivity. His suggestion is that the process of commodification has so utterly consumed this subject that they can't find a space to critique. They haven't got any capacity for critique left in them. But if we eschew the logic of the commodity, the dead object handed around in the marketplace, in favor of these dynamic ongoing processes of assetization, we can actually find a space where agency can uh, exist in the, in the labor environment. And we get this renewed vigor um, about potential sites for labor struggle. Michel Fair also advocates, suggests that in assetized systems, effective struggle can be focused on challenging uh, regimes of investment, such as the valuation of workers' subjectivities, subjective assets by a platform, or investors' speculations on platforms' assets. Um, and just some illustrative, in oh, no, I'll just get past that. illustrative instances is uh, algorithmic gossip. Well, Sophie Bishop I just looked at the time, and so we're, I'm going over. Um, uh, talks about algorithmic gossip um, as a key key form of resistance, which is where um, YouTubers get together uh, and talk collectively about how to game the algorithms. And it's a collective, individualized, small group collective response to um, uh, improving working conditions. The same thing happens in Instapods, where Instagram influencers come together to talk about um, how to improve their work conditions. Uh, we can also think about the response to the Tumblr sex ban, which is a really interesting example of 
uh, unpaid workers in particular, but paid workers as well, creators coming together to resist. Um, they weren't successful in overturning the ban, um, but what they did do was uh, um, both the, um, uh, the subsequent flight of the user community um, from Tumblr in response to the sex ban, um, uh, both as workers and as consumers, did substantial damage to the audience's traffic uh, and ultimately its share price. So uh, for those who don't know, Tumblr was bought by Yahoo in 2013 for 1.1 billion US dollars. And in 2019, after the sex ban and after everyone left, um, the platform was bought for allegedly less than 3 million US dollars. And that's stakeholder action at work. And I think it was partly fear of this kind of stakeholder action, um, which is a mixture of strike and consumer boycott um, and the impact on investor confidence that I think initiated the overturning of the similar ban on sexual content for OnlyFans just recently. Um, and also there's something about the Etsy strike. I could talk about the Etsy strike for a while, but I won't. Anyway, so I think there's much more to be done to understand the complexities of labor struggle because it's taking different forms, I think, within the financialized economy, particularly when everyone's self-employed. Anyway, so conceived as, uh, just to conclude very quickly, conceived as a process of assetization, creative labor may remain a distasteful, perhaps troubling form of commercial activity. But I suggest it must also be considered canning and knowing mobilizations of assets by savvy workers who retain important forms of agency. And so while I've been talking here about online creator culture, what I've described resembles and stems from other forms of creative work uh, and all work that involves immaterial labor, really. So I think there's some broader implications of this thing. So we could think, I think we need to think more about the particular harms uh, of the contemporary economy and its dependence on our identity, intimacy, and affects. And I think moving away from commodification and going into assetization is the way to do that. So thank you very much. Apologies for going over time. I know, I was looking at that. Uh, OK, so we have about uh, yeah, half an hour for the Q&A. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe let me start. Thank you so much, first of all, for this uh, fascinating uh, uh, lecture. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'm going to start by something that uh, just came from uh, your last slide uh -huh. about the struggles. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, because here you mentioned very specific uh, forms of struggles mm -hmm. um, that you said are like hybrid forms in between consumer boycott, uh, so very peculiar forms. But so. A question that I have in mind is, uh, um, speaking of digital labor, which in your book, uh, very rightly, you, you talk about digital labor as an umbrella concept, that mm. uh, it's such a wide concept that has uh, very different uh, understandings. Okay, so the digital labor is the labor of, mm. of the guy who delivers uh, the food during the pandemic, but also this kind of labor, mm. which is a labor in which the soul is put at work, as mm -hmm. uh, Berardi mm -hmm. said. Um, so I wonder, what about forms of like, because unionizing uh, is increasingly, we are increasingly seeing these forms that uh, we thought, OK, nobody's going to unionize again yeah. in this environment. Yeah. It looks pretty, uh, before you said, oh, let me be Marxist. And I was like, <laughs> oh. But so let me be Marxist now let and ask Marxist. you, why are people unionizing in such a context in which uh, as you are rightly pointing out, new forms are emerging of, of struggles, because also new forms of uh, capitalization, if we don't want to mention mm. commodification, mm. are emerging. So in the context of ascetization, how do we understand these emerging uh, struggles that are increasingly going towards unionization? Yeah. I mean, uh, Uber, for example, workers or deliver or workers or Amazon. Mm. I think I, I actually just think the conditions have gotten so bad. The the you know capitalism will eat itself, and I think it has pushed workers too far. I mean, the 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 kind of key conclusion of my book is really about the kind of the conditions that used to be on the margins have been moved to the centre, um, increasingly to the centre. So the kind of precarious, uh, uh, dangerous 
unstable work um, has been uh, um, has been moved to the center. Or, or it's kind of like the center has been expanded out to the margins, pushing people in the margins even further to the margins, right? And I just think it's gone. It's just pushed people too far. So the wave of unionization and formal labor struggle is just, it's heartening because um, it's happening in, in like, you know, Starbucks workers in the US, um, which is a place you don't expect people to be unionizing. Um, I'm thinking about the the union, uh, the strike going on uh, with academics in the UK at the moment as we speak. Um, I think w I think conditions have just gotten. It's like the 70s again, where the conditions got so bad that everyone had to be on strike, right? Um, it's kind of yeah, uh, uh, um, and I think we've had to kind of. So I think that radicalization of unions as well, because unions kind of bought in quite often to the kind of neoliberal struggle uh, and neoliberal governance models in the 90s and, and onwards and became kind of toothless. But I think they've been re-radicalized by a wave of younger people who have much more insecure labor conditions uh, and, and see that, I'm looking, talking to a bunch of you, see that spreading out in front of you for a long period of time. Like, um, that I think that's, I think a lot of it is young people as well. So I think there's, there's a re-radicalization going on. But I think there's also other forms of struggle um, within that that quite often get ignored because everyone's looking at the big strikes and the big unionizations and the kind of very formal approaches to resistance. But there's also, uh, I was thinking about um, you know, multi-homing, the kind of little tactical uh, ways people have of making their precarious work less terrible. So like multi-homing is when you ride for multiple delivery companies and you just pick which one's got the best deal at the time. So um, uh, and people using technology to do that and sharing information. So there's, there's collective work going on and the way workers support each other. Um, uh, you know, people in the um, Julian Posada's work and Oh, God, somewhere in South America. I can't remember the country at the moment. Anyway, but people will share accounts because you can't set up a bank account. So people will collectively have an account. So people work together to create better conditions. They're not overturning capitalism. <laughs> they're not overturning um, and challenging the, the employer, but they're finding ways to make their working conditions better. So. Partly that's what I think is going on here, is just trying to make working conditions better. Um, but increasingly, stakeholder actions are important and shareholder actions, because the, uh, uh, oh God, sorry, it's fallen out my head. Was it Uber? They were going, being publicly listed on the UK Stock Exchange recently. Um, and anyway, they, um, um, they organized a bunch of protests from the workers around the time it was, the, it was going public, and it kind of tanked. People were like, this is risky, this is not a good thing. So it was a way of kind of engaging with a kind of shareholder action, kind of engaging different stakeholders to kind of bring about the kind of change that these workers are looking for. So there's this real complexity in how, how unions struggle. And I think it is important to think them through because increasingly we've got people who are formally self-employed but casting themselves as workers. So the Etsy example is really interesting because they set themselves up as an Etsy union. They went on strike and stopped selling their wares, but they're self-employed creators. Um, but they set themselves up as a union because they don't control certain aspects of their labor because the platform does. So yeah, they're hybrid. So there's a lot of stuff. There is so much going on in, in uh, this. So it should be hopeful. And you know, there's things to be hopeful about in the platform economy because you know, push us too far and we will push back. <laughs> Sorry, that was a very long answer to that question. So. Uh, no, no, actually, so you basically are saying that these uh, different forms of struggling are coexisting because we are also facing these different forms of digital labor. So yeah. there are, if I didn't get you wrong, uh, you're not saying that we should not use the word commodity or commodification for everything concerning yeah. digital labor because yeah. you, you're talking about uh, 
a specific form of labor that exists in the digital world, which is the labor that comes from subjectification. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But when it comes to yeah, the, the, the guys like who work for Amazon, for example, in the warehouses or the delivery guy um, yeah. uh, who, who, who drives around uh, with the food uh, delivery, that's a different story. Yeah. Right? Uh, Can it, you clarify? Because also your book talks about different, and the introduction that I was mentioning in the beginning mm -hmm. uh, also is interesting because uh, starting from your own experience, you kind of like list at least three forms of digital mm -hmm. labor, and one is your own mm -hmm. digital labor when mm -hmm. you dig into the story. So can you explain a little bit what, what the different forms and shapes of digital labor, and if you think that uh, the, the concept of commodity should still, is still a, a valid concept to define something that is going on within this environment, or we should just get rid of it? Okay. Remind me of that second bit of the question. Um, so the, the book, I look at th uh, th I cook three forms of digital labor. So one is unpaid user labor, which is uh, what I wrote the previous book about, um, which is you know how we're all exploited for our data. I probably don't need to explain this to all of you. Exploited for our data and our unpaid content creation uh, in social media platforms, for instance. Um, the other one is platform-mediated work. So I look both at the uh, kind of delivery Uber, uh, I don't know which ones you have here, the kind of classic cycle career uh, delivery um, uh, service, and create a culture. Because it's very interesting that those two forms of digital labor, the literature never crosses over. They never talk to each other. Um, and there's a huge gender divide in terms of who does what in those two areas um, that I kind of wanted to breach. But they are both forms of platform-mediated work which have very similar conditions. They're managed by algorithms. They have the kind of, you know, the whole thing structurally is exactly the same. It's just different people do it in different places and different times. So it's kind of got this whole schism going on. I wanted to go, well, I don't like schisms. I don't like binaries. So I'll smush them together um, into platform-mediated work. And then the third form is work in the digital, um, uh, the kind of tech industry. So looking at people working in Amazon fulfillment centers, but also coders, marketers, um, you know, people working in kind of elite jobs in Silicon Valley, particularly a lot of people in startups as well, and the games industry, et cetera. So kind of that formal end of employment uh, um, within uh, the sector. It was a very hard definition to come to. Oh, I've labored over that definition. I still don't know if it's right. Um, so there are the three forms of work. And so the, the example I, I gave at the start of the book is uh, Tiago Cortez was a delivery rider who, um, during COVID, and he was knocked off his bike and killed um, uh, one night. And he was on the keys of the, the River Liffey in Dublin, directly across from the home of, uh, of all of your favorite social media companies have their European headquarters over in the Silicon Docks in Dublin, uh, um, including Uber, even though Uber it doesn't, isn't allowed to work, operate in Ireland, um, which is kind of interesting. So they're all over the way, and it's just around the corner from me who encountered this story on a social media application the next day, doing my own form of digital labor. So it was just uniting those three forms of work um, together um, seem to kind of make sense to me. Um, but there are very, 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 there are great differences. So my, my book was about uh, kind of trying to understand the specific, what's specific about digital labor across these three forms of work, which is very difficult because they're very different. Um, they have some similar things, but it turns out what they have in common is just, you know, um, is just hardcore capitalism, really, <laughs> in the end. Um, uh, but yeah, I think there are still spaces where commodification is absolutely, absolutely the right framework to use. Um, in fact, uh, I think something Lisa Adkins and others say is that the capacity to assetize is an increasing fault line, social fault line uh, of um, a disadvantage whether you can assetize yourself or not is going to become one of those 
uh, um, fault lines that we need to be looking towards, um, which is really interesting to contemplate. Um, whether that's assetizing your house, um, which is a lot of what they're talking about, but I think also being assetized yourself and your subjectivity or not, uh, whether you're doing, you know, kind of more manual labor that doesn't necessarily involve, although that also involves subjectivity. Ugh, I don't know. But I think there are, I think it is, worth thinking about uh, um, that there are still contexts where commodification is absolutely the right way to think and like poor people having to slaving away in amazon fulfillment centers are not assetizing themselves at all they are you know that's that's pure exploitation of and brutality <laughs> in many ways um yeah Thank you, Kylie. I, I just want to open the floor for questions. Yeah, great. I'm gonna... <clears throat> so what are your thoughts about basic income for unpaid user labor? Ah, uh, wages for Facebook. <laughs> um, Unpaid user labor, I'm like, yeah, what is? I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure where I fit, where I sit on the UBI, uh, the universal basic income. Uh, it has a lot of merits. <laughs> it has a lot of merits. Um, yeah, I, it's your, I, I, I need to think more about UBI. Um, Part of my thing is income is the bit that gets me. But um, yeah, I mean, having having a basic income. I mean, I, uh, I mean, I grew. I'm quite an old lady now, um, but I remember when you know there was a proper welfare system in Australia, and there was a proper welfare system uh, in many places uh, that has fallen aside. Um, but yeah, I, uh, there's a lot of merit in giving people the comfort of not having to struggle to survive, you know. Um, it also provides a space for freedom and uh, uh, um, my, my, I guess one of my big, con big concerns though is that you end up with people finding new and interesting ways to marginalize the lower income, the, the people on UBI, and find ways to m reduce the agency associated with that. I, it's, it's, it's a failure, I think, of, of society uh, that, that has me anxious about it as, as an idea. Um, I don't know if that's, that's completely incoherent. <laughs> if it was for users, right? So like, let's say all Facebook users. So yeah. wouldn't that, isn't there an equalizing thing? So it's you know, someone who doesn't make a lot of money, someone who makes a lot of money, but they all use Facebook, and they all get a basic fee. I basic mean, something. basic fee? Yeah, basic something. I don't know. I, do, I, I just like them to pay their taxes. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're all in Ireland because Ireland is a tax haven, and they're all using the double Irish tax thingy, loophole Mitron thing to not pay taxes. And that would be my preferred way of perhaps, perhaps extracting a, a living wage or some kind of wage from uh, Facebook. I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting what would happen then, you know, with Twitter at the moment, um, with everyone fleeing Twitter, because Elon Musk is an idiot, um, and quite sinister, really. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, to be honest, I just actually like them to pay their taxes a bit. That, that would be my first step. <laughs> Stop them, like, using Ireland as a tax haven. That would be awesome. Because then the whole con uh, economy would collapse in Ireland, um, unfortunately. 17% of Ireland's economy is tied up in tech and, you know, invisible finance companies. It would fall apart if they left. It's terrifying. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just having a moment. Other questions? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Kai, for, for your talk. It was really inspiring. Um, so I was wondering um, um, uh, if uh, you were also 
thinking about the um, uh, positions within and the ideas within uh, again post post -Marx Marxist thought, uh, in which subjectivity is also thought to be not just uh, externally uh, again abstracted and sold uh, as a commodity. Um, which again is like a little bit of the um, position you are creating in um, uh, your talk, uh, but also the, the kind of uh, the idea that uh, capital uh, is directly uh, involved in the production of subjectivity. So rather than being externally uh, mm. selling and abstracting it, uh, is uh, producing directly. Uh, our way of living, mm -hmm. um, because in my opinion, really fits also with your um, framework on uh, acidization, uh, because again, it's telling us, uh, maybe in my mind it comes again the work maybe of Maurizio Lazzarato, the, the recent work on, uh, for instance, in science, science and Machines, uh, which again draws from the post-structuralist uh, uh, reading of subjectivity. So again, building uh, on um, this idea that capital uh, uh, directly intervenes uh, in the production of, of the self. Uh, because in my opinion, it's, it's again uh, a good um, way to deal with the problem you were, you were discussing. Uh, so this idea that uh, rather than being externally uh, produced, there is also this kind of self-enjoyment you were uh, describing. Uh, so I was wondering if you were also you were also thinking of this kind of connection in your work. If it can be useful uh, uh, to discuss also ascetization uh, in relation again to the production of uh, subjectivity directly by by capital. Yeah, I mean, in many ways that's my starting point um, for a lot of my thinking. Um, I came out of cultural studies, so and I came out of cultural studies in the 90s where we were all celebrating consumption and... Um, uh, but it, it's still in... Like, I, I, I don't know how subjectivity exists outside of capitalism. Like, who has a subjectivity it, uh, in, in, you know, I mean, there are places, obviously, <laughs> but it's very hard to find places where your subjectivity is not fundamentally shaped by capitalism because that is the air you breathe. It is your entire existence. And so that's partly my, my, and that's cultural studies in a nutshell, is like, we are fundamentally shaped by it. How do we make it less crap, <laughs> you know? Um, and I, to me, that's kind of where we're at. It's like, I can't, I can't ever be that free worker, um, that free laborer that Marx describes because I don't have an outside. Um, uh, it's beyond me, it's beyond all of us, I think, at this point. Um, maybe, you know, you know, imminent climate collapse will give us an outside of capitalism, may not be one we want, um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of where my thinking, I, it, yeah, my subjectivity, our subjectivities are just imbued with capital um, logic. So it's really hard. And so that's partly why this commodification thesis that everyone just keeps, I had to find a way to argue against it because it just doesn't sit right with me because I can't find the outside. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure that answers your question. I, d I didn't get yeah, very... Yeah, absolutely. Um, may I have another point or... Is there any, any other question? Ladies first, and then go back to you. Um, so in the framework, or in the idea of if we're in capitalism in the society, is it sort of then the goal to be able to um, make yourself, like have the beyond platforms sell your image and have like brands pay you like, is then that, like, if we accept that this is our, like, reality, mm -hmm. then is that the goal for us? Uh, I don't know if it's the goal. Um, or, or, like, is that kind of, like, winning, then, like, being able to, instead of, like, being on these platforms for free, um, then you're on it, because most people, maybe except for Professor Migali, are on the platforms. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in that case, if you are actually on them, like, I mean, either you're there for free and they're making money off you or you're mm -hmm. doing the same thing, but you're getting paid. Is it then like, 
Yeah. Well, I mean, the goal could be, you know, um, non-commercial platforms um, to be doing the same kind of work. If everyone's fleeing to Mastodon at the moment and the federated system there, which is kind of non-commercial. Um, yeah, I, do, it's, I don't think it's the goal. It's le So I don't know. Yeah, I, I think the goal is just pleasure, right? Um, the kind of the radical version of pleasure. Um, uh, but maybe it doesn't need to have a goal. <laughs> it seems kind of transactional to have a goal um, and just doing it. Oh, no, it's back. Lovely. Um, yeah, maybe maybe just radical pleasure is the goal. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if I'd necessarily... I wouldn't be advocating becoming an influencer, uh, not least because it's really, really hard work and it's really, really, really underpaid. Um, uh, the amount of unpaid labour that goes into creating and monetizing your content is uh, extraordinary. Um, uh, Although, of course, I, I keep getting asked if I want to monetize. I, I set up an Instagram for my cats. I'm that kind of tragic person. <laughs> but I want to share photos of them with people who care and not all the other people in my social media who don't care about my cats. Uh, but I keep getting bombarded with, like, oh, do you want to monetize this? Do you want to, like, you know, pay this money and we'll, you know, promote it for you? Which is kind of, so it kind of passively happens to you that you end up uh, um, trying to monetize. But... I, I haven't, I should add. I haven't monetized my cats. Um, I don't think it's the goal. I just think it's not It's not the harm that's being just attributed to it. It doesn't have the harm being attributed to it. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Sorry, that's another rambly answer. Rambling all over the place. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Okay, so I noticed this thing in especially like my generation where we tend to want to work simply to be order takers because we're just so sick of this idea of um, basically everything that you were talking about, about becoming these assets of ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we have this rejection towards technology, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we just want to live in the commodity of the technology. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a dualism that can coexist. And like my question is, how do these two ideas coexist as we have this rejection, but also depend on the automation to be these order takers to complete the jobs that we don't want to make? Okay. <laughs> what technologies are you rejecting? What technologies? Um, basically, like we have this idea of we just uh, want to be dissociated, like from technology, like mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. just destroying our lives. We are all very conscious of this, and um, with the jobs and everything, we just many want to be like entrepreneurs, as you were talking about, but like another big part of the population, and I think this also accelerated with COVID because we have the facility of doing everything online. Mm -hmm. So we have these jobs so we can, that allow us to be simply order takers and dissociate like from all of the jobs mm -hmm. that we're doing to not become part of this process of aestheticizing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, we're depending on these technologies that we um, like tend to hate. So it's like a duality that I can't understand how it coexists. Yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one. Like it's kind of, it's kind of life, though, isn't it? <laughs> so you're talking about people uh, kind of buying out of the kind of entrepreneurial, uh, that that kind of do what you love, you know, drive, you know, um, you know, design the next big thing kind of thing. You're, you're talking about people buying out of that and kind of just going, I just want a job that pays me a, a wage. That I, so I can live my life outside of that. Yeah, but at the same time, reliant on the technologies that facilitate it. Yeah. Um, I think they are quite separate. I, th I think it's really interesting. So I was using um, a, 
oh, what's his name? Seriously, this is my COVID brain. It's refusing to give me words sometimes. Um, your man, some guy, whatever his name is, he talks about entrepreneurial passion and doing what you love um, as a kind of... Um, he, talk, he talks about the... Um, uh, instead of the industrial age, he says we live in the industrious age. So talking about hustle and hustle as the kind of driver of the economy, um, which is one of those things that came from the margin and has kind of gone into um, the kind of center of labor. Um, but I think also that was it only came out like two years ago. I think it's already timed out because I think, as you said, COVID created a whole different universe whole different experience of life um, that I think people might be seeing through the bullshit of hustle and industriousness um, and, and that the precarity that comes with that. So just having a stable job, because for such a long time, you know, it was, it was anathema to have a stable job. If you had the same job for years, what were you doing? What were you like? Oh, my God. Like, you had to constantly renew. You had to constantly be updating. And I think, you know, uh, we lost the job for life. Uh, and then they made a virtue of not having a job for life and say, no, it's great to always constantly be changing your job. Um, and now I think people are going, no, I actually just want a job. I just want to check some boxes. I want to be the man in the grey flannel suit uh, who goes to work and comes home and has a nice life. Um, and, I think, and I think that comes back to conditions getting so terrible that the critique of capitalism is no longer based around um, what Botansky and Chiavello would, would call the, the kind of artistic critique, and it's more about the material conditions. And I think that's what's driving people's uh, uh, kind of a, uh, you know critical engagement with capitalism. Their kind of justification for work is not about self fulfilment, maybe, and it's shifting back towards, you know, I'd like something secure and safe and stable and that I don't have to think about too much because um, there's other things in my life. Mind you, I had one of those jobs and it sucked. And then I got this job which just absorbs all of my everything and I, mean, I don't know which one's worse. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm torn. I don't know again if that answered your question, but I think, I think, there, I think there's a shift in the critique. Um, I could go off on the Boltanski and Cipello and the artistic critique versus the other critique, but I won't. There's some of that in the book. <laughs> okay, so uh, last comment again. Uh, um, because I, again, I, I think it's really fasc fascinating in this framework you're, you're proposing. Uh, um, so thinking again on the, about the human capital uh, issue, I was wondering um, the, maybe by having a uh, sort of uh, technological determinist position on that, the idea that again networks uh, and digital networks are in some way the technology of the neoliberal subject. Uh, so I was wondering if maybe again this is a, also uh, a technology, technology driven uh, kind of process, the culmination of this process again we are having from uh, um, again in this passage again you were also mentioning from industrialism and then the, the neoliberal logic in contemporary times so maybe uh, again if we can also think of technology as a kind of uh, uh, drivers of this also this framework, this way of thinking uh, because again also the idea of assets uh, I mean last semester we had also a talk on uh, about NFTs, uh, and for instance, in that se sector there, again, the idea of assets uh, is really used a lot, again, uh, yeah, because there is this, again, uh, clear um, neoliberalization, again, of digital uh, uh, images in some way. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, so just this point on Yeah, well, technology. I mean, the, the finance market is, is all about technology. It always has been, whether it's been telegraph or uh, um, digital technologies, they, 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 they're in lockstep together um, because it is a virtualization. The assets and, and human capital is this, this valuing 
ether, <laughs> the same way as an NFT, the same way as crypto um, currencies, just value nothing. Um, all finance values nothing these days since it's divested from the gold standard. All money is virtual. Uh, even if you've got a physical note, it's it's just a piece of paper, you know, but it has this other virtual meaning. So I think... Um, <laughs> God, I don't, sorry, I've forgotten where I was going with this. Um, so, yeah, I think I think there is definitely a, a, a link to technology and technologization and assetization. Um, but I think assetization is also happening more materially because a lot of people talk about it in relation to housing and the assetization of the family home from being a space you live in to a space that you have for an investment. You flip it and you make money. Um, so I don't think it's always associated with, you know, digital technologies, for instance. But I think digital technology is so bound up with the financialized economy uh, because it's what enables the global data flows that is the global financial economy. It's just zeros and ones. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a technological component. Um, yeah, I think that's what I mean. <clears throat> I want to mention something because um, I think a year ago, I mean, in between the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, I did a research, a small one, like an ethnographic study with a couple of students here at John Cabot University on only fans. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because the findings of this research were like the people we interviewed were pretty much all of them, whether male, female, non-binary, mm -hmm. self-identifying as queer. So mm -hmm. no matter what was their gender or you know, pretty much the same age, like 20 year old people, they were using the word Empowerment. This was the recurring uh, word uh, used by all the people we interviewed uh, to justify, not to justify, to explain why they were on OnlyFans. Mm. They felt empowered at at least two different levels. Uh, mm -hmm. One level uh, because there was like a wage, so they could earn, make a living, right? And on the other hand, there was also the aspect of like feeling boosted mm, by mm, OnlyFans, mm, right? Mm. So feeling appreciated by people uh, and, and feeling that you can choose actually when you post the picture, what kind of picture you post, you know? So this was the recurring word that they mm. were using. So completely out of the logic of co commodification, of course. They were describing mm. a word that was, uh, well, pretty much on the other side, like I have the power, I can mm -hmm. do this, I can do that. So that was uh, fascinating. I, I just wanna, wanted to uh, mention this. Mm -hmm. But actually, my question, because you brought up uh, the um, uh, Twitter issue, mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys are on Twitter, and uh, are, how many of you are, are on Twitter? Ah, pretty much. So are you guys migrating to Mastodon, or are you staying on Twitter? Who is migrating to Mastodon? No one. Okay, that, that's a good. Uh, I, I mm. bet that this generation is staying on Twitter. And to be honest, I'm staying on I'm Twitter staying too. On Twitter. I've got a because <clears throat> no. What I want to bring it up. Uh, okay, so when did we think that Twitter was not a non-commercial venture? I mean, I know Elon Musk is disturbing, as you mm. said, mm. but the point for me of migrating to Mastodon. It's not that Mastodon, okay, Mastodon is the uh, so-called open source, non, not for profit option mm. to Twitter, right? Which has been existing for years mm. now. So mm. I guess that folks, uh, if they were against the commercial logic of Twitter, they could have migrated a yeah. uh, long time ago. They just non, don't need to wait for Musk to take yeah. over because yeah. even the people who were there before, Dorsey and company, I mean, these are nice guys, we don't know them, but they're still venture capitalists, right? Yeah. So my point is, if you look at Mastodon, I don't know if you guys, uh, have you ever visited Mastodon? Please do it. Uh, 
Mm. It, the point, the problem for me, uh, that Mastodon reproduces uh, the same, not only the interface mm. of Twitter, mm. but the interactions uh, mm. that are going on, not only on Twitter, on pretty much every single social, plat social media platform I know about, which is based on relations that are exploitative, like mm. followers, uh, likes, mm. Mm. comments, uh, you know, that kind of... Uh, Rela model of relationality mm. that is proposed by and sold by Twitter, mm. Facebook, and, and TikTok, and everything else, uh, it's exactly reproduced in the open source non-commercial version. So my question is, uh, isn't that, I mean, it, it's not only a matter of being commercial or for mm. profit or capitalist or commodify. The problem is that we are, in my view, um, witnessing a shift, a fundamental shift of our mode of uh, being together, mm. okay, um, which is now quantified. Uh, so mm -hmm. quantification and computation is now the way in which we are, um, uh, you know, m moving around when it comes mm -hmm. to social interaction. So Mastodon does not sell, uh, so does not propose an alternative model of being together. It's exactly the same mm. uh, with a more geeky interface uh, and the yeah. non-for-profit. It, so it, it does do something slightly different in that it doesn't boost tweets based on likes. If you favorite someone, um, it doesn't, it just tells that person that you liked it. It doesn't actually add into the algorithm. It's not, the algorithms work differently. And that if you actually want to boost someone's post, you have to retweet it. That's the only thing that gets counted as a as a thing. So it's slightly different. It's still a quant still a quantification, but, though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the followers, uh, the the kind of like relationships mm -hmm. that are nurtured by Mastodon mm -hmm. are, in my view, exactly the same. Oh, it's exactly the same. Yeah. It's the same. So the problem same, is same. the model of. Uh, the ways in which we are uh, thinking about society. The other, the other really. thing is content moderation because it's a federated server system. So there's like some random person who happens to be running an instance, whether it's like .ie or .social or .lol or whatever, Mastodon instance, and they are basically in control of moderation, which is better or worse. You know, it turns out having a massive scaled moderation system that everyone complained about is actually better sometimes than having just some random guy um, doing it. So it's, yeah, it's interesting watching Mastodon play out um, as a new platform. Um, well, not new, it's been around for like six years or something, but as a, as a newly popular platform, <laughs> maybe. Um, maybe that's more accurate, but yeah. I remember the first time I saw uh, Mastodon was in a squat, actually, in Forte <laughs> Brenestino. For those of you who know, it's an important squat here in Rome for uh, tech stuff. Mm -hmm. And they showed Mastodon, and uh, most of the squatters, they said, what's the point? Because actually, yeah. We yeah, just it, it was other? pretty much the same mm. uh, kind of... Uh, well, it's interesting. My, my students don't use Twitter very much either. They, they are on it, but they don't use it. And they use Snapchat and um, WhatsApp. That's the... So they're actually just doing interpersonal communication rather than platform-based stuff, which I think is interesting in itself. It's just old people like me who tweet and put, use Facebook. Oh, my God, I'm using Facebook because <laughs> I'm so old. I'm basically dead. That's how old I am. Um, yeah, well, it's according to my students anyway. Um, they could just be Irish students. Who knows? Anyway, I, I think we should wrap it up because mm -hmm. it's uh, eight o'clock, unless uh, someone wants to add something quick. Yep, they Sorry for uh, <laughs> no, no. taking over with the Mastodon question, but I was like, uh, because I see all my friends migrating. So <laughs> is there anyone who wants to make a final comment or question? No? OK, so I think uh, we can go home and assetize. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I want to thank you, Kylie, for being with us today. I want to thank uh, everyone who was here tonight. Thank you to the tech people. Yeah, the people who have, <laughs> help, who have helped us, uh, Media Lab, uh, the staff, maintenance, uh, Professor Michali, the Com Department, and see you next uh, season of Digital Delights and Disturbance. <laughs>